A man approaches two young girls playing outside their homes and asks them to find a lost puppy. One of those girls would never be seen alive again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Samantha Runyon. Viewer discretion is advised. I do want to let you know that this is a case that happened against a child, a very young child. So if cases like that are something you have a hard time listening to, I totally understand. Uh, I just wanted to give you guys a warning. I'm going to try to do that from now on whenever there is uh, a case about a child. Samantha Runyon was born on July 26, 1996, and she was born in Boston, Massachusetts. However, by the time this case occurs, her and her family are living in the Riverside County, California area. Samantha Runyon was just five years old. Samantha Runyon did not get a chance to live. I don't have much information about who she was because she wasn't given that opportunity to find out who she was. Her mom would say that Samantha was just this type of kid who had a, a gift that she was going to be for the world. She was just your really typical young girl. She loved playing with dolls and playing outside with her friends. Even at five years old, Samantha's favorite quote, something she liked to say was, be brave. And unfortunately, there was a day in her life where she had to be brave and she had to fight like hell. But unfortunately, she would not win that fight. It was July 15th, 2002. It was just a week or so before Samantha's sixth birthday. She would never get to turn six. That day was uh, a really great day for her. She was uh, with her grandma earlier in the afternoon and they went and got ice cream and she was just in such a good, happy mood. A little bit later in the evening, which when she's back at her, I think it was like an apartment complex, is this big like patch of green grass kind of in the in this apartment complex. And that's where her and all the other kids in this little area love to go outside and play. Typically, she was told by her parents, you know, you can only play in this little green yard and can't go anywhere else because, you know, just we want to be able to see you. But Samantha, according to her mom, would love to hide in a certain location, knowing her mom was coming home from work. And then she always loved to jump out and scare her mom. So sometimes Samantha would wander off from kind of like that that grassy uh, field area, but never too far away and never away from people's eyes. So on that evening, this is approximately at 6.30 p.m., Samantha and her friend Sarah are outside. They're actually playing a board game outside. The girls notice this green vehicle drive up to next to where they were. And at that point, they were actually playing in this little like this area between the garages, which is right outside of this green uh, grass area like a little within feet of it, but they're playing a board game. They're having fun, but this green car passes by them. And then a man gets out of that car. The man approaches the two girls and says, I, you know, I'm looking for my lost puppy. Can you help me find my puppy? And Samantha being a humongous animal lover, she absolutely loved animals. She was more than happy to help this man find his dog. But all that man was doing was lying to those little girls because he knew they were these sweet, innocent little girls who would believe anything. He took advantage of it. Sarah would later say that the guy seemed really nice initially. He, he seemed like a concerned guy looking for his dog. The man was beginning to describe what this puppy was, like what it looked like, what type of dog it was. But literally in the middle of him explaining it, he just suddenly grabs Samantha and bolts towards his car. And at that point, she is screaming to her friend Sarah, please go get my grandma. So let me backtrack. I think this actually was her grandma's complex. Sarah then witnesses the man throw her best friend into this v this green car. And this all happens within like seconds. It, it's like, no, even if she got someone, there would have been no chance to, to come out and, you know, and save her. This happened so fast. But once he threw Samantha in the car, he got in, sped away. Sarah runs to the grandma and they immediately call 911. And they have to tell 911 the one thing that no parent, no grandparent 
ever wants to say, my granddaughter has been kidnapped by a stranger. Police arrive on scene within minutes, and I, I want to give a lot of credit to Sarah here because for being only five or six years old, she is or was absolutely incredible at describing this man. And you'll find out a little bit later why. But she is able to provide police with a very detailed description of this man, that he was this Hispanic male around 25, maybe 30 years old. He was heavy set. He had this very prominent mustache and his hair was black and it was slicked kind of back. And then she even described the car as being a green Honda. So they came up with a composite drawing and usually these drawings are pretty kind of terrifying to look at because typically they're never, they're never really spot on or perfect. And so there's always something unusual about them. But this is one of the rare ones, for me at least, where it just looks like it looks like an actual person. Because so often they look almost kind of like a person, but sort of terrifying at the same time, like not totally real. This one is really legit. So police and FBI get involved. They set up a command center just outside of this apartment complex. They go door to door, knocking on everybody's door just to see if they witnessed anything. But they're also combing out and they are searching for miles around this area. They've got helicopters in the air. They're trying to find this car. They are mobilizing just tons of people really quickly and searching through everywhere they can to see if they can find her. I mean, this was like an all hands on deck, everybody got involved type scenario. And then... Once this hit the news, it was like covered all over the news stations in the area. They started to get tips after tip after tip. Hundreds of leads and tips came in. But one name in particular came up very frequently. It was the name of a 27-year-old man named Alejandro Alex Avila. Just based on the description, it looked a lot like him, according to you know witnesses or people who called in tips. So as they're kind of processing those leads and that name and trying to like find out where this guy is, where he lives, they're continuing to search. It would be about 23 hours after Samantha was kidnapped from the front part of the apartment complex when a horrific discovery was made. A man had been hiking near Lake Elsinore, and I guess this was in the Cleveland National Forest. This is... 50-ish miles or so away, 50, 60 miles away from where Samantha was kidnapped from. The man finds the body um, of a young child just thrown in some bushes. And he even recalled that this little girl seemed to be posed almost like a doll. Like she was just kind of deliberately put in this location. Police get there as soon as they possibly can and, you know, decomposition hasn't obviously started at that point, but they were able to identify who the body was very quickly. It was the body of five-year-old Samantha Runyon. Samantha had bruises all over her body. She had cuts all over her body. She also had a number of defensive wounds on her hands. And she had, at the coroner's office, they would collect a very large amount of skin cell DNA under Samantha's fingernails. Meaning she scratched her attacker a lot. And she collected a lot of his skin and DNA. The coroner determined that she had been very violently sexually assaulted. She had two very uh, distinct blows to her head which actually probably made her unconscious or something along those lines, but there was a lot of swelling in her brain. But ultimately what cost her her life was strangulation. The man strangled her manually with his hands. Based on the coroner's uh, autopsy, they would determine that Samantha was likely alive until about 2 a.m. on the, you know, the following day after she was taken. There was probably about a six hour time frame where Samantha was still alive with this man, meaning he did God knows what to her, God knows how many times in that six hour time span. And like I just said, they collected a bunch of skin cells. They were able to create a very strong profile of whoever this person was. They just needed to find that person. But they had this name that kept coming up, Alejandro Avila. They look into his past. Well, he's definitely got a past. 
It turns out uh, about a year or so prior, about in 2001, Avila had sexually molested his then girlfriend's nine-year-old child. And also that girl, he sexually molested her cousin as well. He was arrested and charged for those crimes. However, a jury did not find him guilty because they did not have enough evidence. It, it seemed like the two girls weren't really believed. He's also, they find out, living in the Lake Elsinore area, which is where her body was found. So they finally find him and they ask him about all of this. They question him. He denies having any responsibility. He says, I don't know who she is. I didn't do anything to her. It's not me. He tells police, well, I was at the mall pretty much most of the day. Really, most of the day. But then when they talked to his mom, his mom said, well, you know, Alex was supposed to cook dinner for us that night, but he canceled and said he was busy and he couldn't, he couldn't make it. So they're looking now into like his credit card statements, bank account statements. They find out that on the night of the kidnapping, he used one of his cards, his debit cards or credit cards to book a motel room. And it's likely that he did that if he was the person to do all of this. Uh, that's where he took Samantha and did what he did to her. They also checked his cell phone data and his cell phone showed to be in the area of Samantha's grandma's apartment complex during the time the kidnapping would have happened. They then had were able to get search warrants for where uh, Alex Avila was living and they find some really disturbing things on his computer. He had a lot of child pornography on his computer. He was, they found records of him chatting in chat rooms that were for pedophiles. They discovered that in the morning before Samantha was abducted at about 4.43 a.m., someone printed off something that they found on their, on the internet, I guess. And this thing that was printed out was a story about adults, adult men who sexually assault children. They also found chat room things of him talking to a man in Finland about their desire to have intercourse with children. Uh, but they said, well, family is off limits, but anything else is fine. They also find on his property a green Honda. It's, it's his car. So they forensically analyze the car and they find this sort of dried up liquid on inside the car and they swab it and it's uh, it's actually DNA. And they believe that, that those white dried up marks were actually tears uh, from Samantha. Later, they would find out that that DNA profile was Samantha's. They then get a warrant for his DNA and they run it. It is uh, an exact match. All of the DNA found underneath uh, Samantha's fingernails were his. They also had DNA from male bodily fluid on her body, also his, 100%. They also had tire tracks and shoe impressions at the site where the body was dumped. The tire tracks were an exact match to the vehicle he drove, that green Honda. The foot, the shoe impressions were the exact matches to the shoes they found in his home. Within about eight or nine days of the abduction and murder, Alejandro Avila is arrested and charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder. He still denied having anything to do with it. What they found out was that the girl that he had sexually molested a year prior, that he got away with it, basically. Where that girl lived, that assault happened, just so happened to be the same apartment complex where the grandma, Samantha's grandma lived, where the abduct abduction happened. What they think is that Mr. Avila probably thought that that young girl still lived there. She didn't. And so he went there to find her. And when he couldn't find her, he just saw these two girls playing and said, okay, well, I'll just take one of these instead. Uh, he then would book a motel room where he would do unspeakable things to this five-year-old child and then kill her. The evidence, especially the physical evidence, unbelievably overwhelming. But what I, I find most incredible is that the description the little girl Sarah gave of the assailant to me is an exact freaking match. Like she described this man perfectly. And that's just so incredible to me. And she did point him out like, yeah, that's the guy. And so it was confirmed. But 
when you look at the side-by-side -side comparison of the composite uh, sketch and the photo of his booking of his arrest, it's uncanny. She was amazing. It was because of her sketch that was put out on the news that when people called in tips, that that's how they found out his name. I don't even know if they would have found out who he was if it wasn't for that composite drawing. So Sarah in this story to me is, is like the unsung hero of the whole thing. I wish I was, I can't describe any, I can't even describe probably my own family <laughs> and to give a description. So I'm just like, it was just amazing. So they had the DNA, they had the eyewitness, uh, you know, matching, they identified him. They had the cell phone data being in the area of the kidnapping. He lived in the uh, area where the body was dumped. They had the tire tracks, the shoe impressions, the DNA, everything was overwhelming. And so Alejandro Avila was found guilty of all charges and he was sentenced to death. Sometime around 2005, he would uh, appeal, and his appeal was basically that this case was so high profile in the news that they should have moved venues because he believes because of the media he got an unfair trial. The courts were like, shut up, no. <laughs> and they denied him. So his murder conviction was upheld and his death penalty was upheld. And I, from what I understand, I believe he is still awaiting his execution. This is California. I don't believe they're executing people right now. Uh, so I don't know if that'll ever actually happen. Samantha's mom, Erin, this obviously was completely devastating for her and Samantha's dad to, to deal with. I mean, this was something no parent should ever have to experience. But through that devastation, her mom would become a very vocal advocate for children and for protecting children and making sure as best as she could that just doesn't happen again um, like what happened to Samantha. She actually would establish um, a foundation called the Joyful Child Foundation and what it does is it educates, it empowers, it helps unify the communities and just it's, it's there as a program to try to prevent anything like this from happening again. She was also very vocal with the uh, with the government, um, making sure Amber Alerts were uh, prominent in California. And ever since, uh, her mom has just been an absolute warrior and just an incredible human being, just being there for any and all children um, to make sure this doesn't happen to them. It's horrific and horrible what happened to Samantha, but if you want to look at this as like, if if there is anything that you can say that positive came from this, is that, is the fact that, you know, this, this, her nonprofit now exists and you have this Amber Alert system now prominent in California. No, it's everywhere now at this point, but it's just, you know, she, she's turned it into something really amazing and she is a hell of a person. She's a hell of a woman. She's a hell of a mom. She is just, she's extremely brave and I just think it's so cool. But thankfully, um, thanks a, a lot in part to her best friend, Sarah, uh, and then thankfully that Samantha fought like hell and she scratched the living shit out of this guy and, and she did not just sort of go quietly. Because of all of that, Samantha Runyon was able to get the justice that she rightfully deserved. But... That is it for this case, True Crime Maroonie Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. Hope you found it interesting. The battery's about to die. Uh, please subscribe if you like true crime. I tell true crime stories all the time on here. Also on TikTok. My TikTok links are in the link tree in the description of this video below. You will also find my uh, merch store in the link tree below. We ship all over the world. We have t-shirts and hoodies and stuff. If there's a case you want me to cover, whether it's a true crime case or a spooky haunted story or alien story or whatever, just send me a quick email. My email is also listed below. And I'll add that name to my, my list. The list is 6,300 names long. I can't promise you when I get to that case, but I will get to it eventually. Um, it's blinking. Uh, so anyway, that is it for the story. And we will see you for the next case. So ta-ta off and out. Drug crime. Maroney, don't eat, diggle, berry, dong, 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 dongs. Yeah. <laughs>